Well, hello, everybody, anteaters out there in the virtual space. Uh, welcome to uh, UCI Alumni's program, Lunch with Eaters. Uh, we have a very, very special program today featuring Chef Rachel from Black Market Bakery. This is Jeff Menhas. I am the executive director at the UCI Alumni Association. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, we're very excited to have you. We have uh, a great turnout today on this uh, Lunch with Eaters series. Um, we're, I wanna give a quick spotlight on this. Uh, we're, we're doing this program now twice a month virtually as a Lunch and Learn program series that is built to inform and engage with the UCI alumni community. Of course, uh, we have programs for alumni all the time. We're used to doing them in person, but we have quite a few virtual programs now as we are dealing with uh, social distancing uh, around the world and definitely within the United States. So, so thank you for banding together with us today. Uh, we're hoping to provide a lot of relevant content to you, interesting content, uh, things that we might normally uh, not have experimented with before. So we have, uh, uh, we're gonna make a series out of this. Uh, all of our virtual content is spotlighted on a specific website, which is new. Uh, it's called the Anteaters Go Virtual uh, homepage. And uh, we have the link for that. Uh, we're gonna share that uh, definitely on the last slide of this presentation. But if anyone wants to visit now, it's bit.ly slash UCI virtual. And that page is full of resources to feel connected and engage with fellow alumni and also to fellow uh, UCI students, because we're in this together. You as alumni can participate in a number of ways to support both the student body as alumni mentors or career panelists or uh, helping, the, helping the UCI community in one of many different ways. You can support our emergency response fund for students, et cetera. Or you could find lots of more uh, relevant virtual programming like this, because we're in this together. So uh, once again, welcome everyone. Uh, I want to let you all know in the audience that you're muted in order to eliminate background noise and interference, understandably. But we are going to uh, be fielding questions. So I want to invite everyone to use the chat function on Zoom to submit questions. And then we'll have a Q&A portion at the end. So once again, use the, the chat function to provide those uh, questions. So now I'm going to introduce our featured speaker, and that is Chef Rachel. Uh, a UCI anthropology uh, alumna, Rachel Klemick, class of 1990, is owner and chef of Black Market Bakery, which has a presence in Costa Mesa, Santa Ana, and San Diego, and is quite popular amongst the locals in these markets. She discovered her passion for baking a little later in life, but it was a passion that led her to graduate at the top of her class from the Culinary Institute of America in Napa Valley and create the business that we all know and love today. Originally starting off her idea in an industrial park across from John Wayne Airport, Black Market Bakery has grown and been named Best Bakery in 2010 by OC Weekly. It has also had reviews appear in the Wall Street Journal, Westways, and Shape Magazine. She also won Food Network Chopped Sweets. So let's give her a Big anteater welcome and thank you, Rachel, for kicking off this virtual event series. We'll turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so glad to be here. Um, this is actually my first Zoom experience, so if anything seems a little odd or whatever, I apologize. Get in the hang of it. Um, as Jeff said, my name is Rachel Klemick. Um, when I was at UCI, I was actually Rachel Parsons. Uh, graduated, like he mentioned. 1990 anthropology degree. Um, in my time at UCI, I did kind of a lot of different quirky things. I wanted to mention a couple of them. Number one, um, I was actually the lab tech at the UCI ceramic studio in the fine arts building. So I was making clay, making glazes, firing student work, hopefully not blowing anything up. And ironically, or fittingly, I don't know which it is, um, Having started with that, you know, making something and putting it in a chamber, an oven, a kiln, kind of foreshadowed my, my baking uh, career. So who knew? Um, in addition to that, I was actually a DJ on KUCI, which was a really amazing, great experience. I had a lot of um, awesome time at UCI. 
and um, in January of 1991, I actually married my husband, who also went to UCI. His name is David Klemek, um, hence the name, at the University Club. So we kind of have a, a thread through my whole life of dealing with UCI and, and being a part of the community. Um, after I left UCI, I did pursue a graduate degree at UNC Chapel Hill um, in anthropology and realized pretty quickly that it wasn't my jam, so to speak. Academia was not cut out for me or I wasn't cut out for it or we just mutually decided to part ways. And I pursued um, something which was a little more hands-on, a little more tangible. So baking came actually later after I'd already had four children who were all in their 20s. Um, and all went to Woodbridge High School, which is um, also right here in Irvine, for those of you guys who, well, you all know. Um, it wasn't until I was like 31 years old that I decided I wanted to go to culinary school. So I went to the CIA in Napa Valley and moved my whole family up there. And everyone said, like, oh, it's so cool. You get to you know, live in Napa Valley and live this cool life in Calistoga. But you know, with four very small children, it wasn't, um, we weren't like going to day spas and wineries all the time. So it was a little, a little interesting experience. It was a great place to, to live. But we came back down to Orange County to be closer to extended family. Um, at that point, I worked at a place called Melise in Santa Monica, who was a sister ministry shop, and then at Zoe's in Tustin, which some of you might be familiar with, um, as an overnight baker. And then I decided, like, why not try my hand at business? I have, my husband and I both kind of have this DIY mentality, like, there's probably ways to do this, and someone probably knows, but we're just going to figure it out. Um, that's led to challenges obviously but also a lot of kind of deep knowledge because i've learned a lot of stuff the hard way so um and and, and baking as well as business and parenting and everything else um what else once we built out our kitchen in john wayne airport kind of flight path right in sky park circle we started doing farmers markets so i don't know if any of the people tuning in today have ever um, gone to the UCI farmers market back when it was in the parking lot near in and out Burger. We were there eight years every Saturday. It was a great experience. Really allowed, um, it's kind of trial by fire. You know, you're standing there under your tent with your table and your, all your baked goods and people are either going to walk right by or they're going to stop and talk to you and buy something or tell you why they like it or tell you why they don't like it. So it was a good kind of small business 101 in terms of really getting comfortable with representing one's product. Um, another thing I did during that time was we had, a, we had, and I should say we still have, this big industrial kitchen in Irvine on Sky Park Circle. So I did a lot of classes. So education in terms of baking became a really important part of my mantra and my kind of identity almost. I did end up teaching at Cypress College for four years. I was the baking instructor and taught basic and advanced baking. Um, picked up some really great employees there, which is uh, fine. It's the way it works. Um, and then we kind of came around to this feeling of, well, how do we grow the business? We were doing wholesale, we were doing classes, we were doing farmer's markets. We needed a location. So we looked kind of hither and yon all around 2012. We were searching and we stumbled upon the camp shopping center in Costa Mesa which hopefully a lot of you are familiar with. It's across the street from the lab, Anti Mall, and owned by Shaheen Sadehi and his wife, Linda. Um, really iconoclast in terms of envisioning a really experiential retail environment. So we opened that January 2nd of 2013. So we've actually been open there seven years. Again, trial by fires, things worked, things didn't. You know, it's always pivoting and adjusting. One thing I do tell people all the time if they're interested in business in any way is the key is to just show up every day because there are days when you really don't want to show up. There are days when you feel like you want to just like lay in bed and cry or binge watch TV or whatever it is. But if you go in every day, things will happen because you are putting yourself there. You can't check out emotionally. So that is what I've been doing and continue to do it. Earlier today, I was at the bakery, shuffling around, helping people, and, and 
getting getting product out. We are still open, but on a limited capacity, obviously, um, not allowing anyone inside. We just have a table in front of the door. But it's actually we it's forced us to be more creative in terms of providing content for customers, recipes, videos also doing online ordering and just finding other products to sell. So it's actually been a really um, a blessing in disguise. Um, we also have a location in Santa Ana at on Broadway in the Artist Village, um, kind of where the art walks are. And that is closed at the moment. Um, we have a location down in San Diego in North Park. I have a managing partner down there, so I'm not always running back and forth, but she's been with me I think going on 12 years, and she is also an anthropology major who kind of came out of Davis and showed up on my doorstep and said, I want to own a bakery someday, and I'm like, okay, do what I do. Um, and then we're opening one in East Village. One last thing I'll mention, and if people have questions later, I can totally um, go over it. I was on Chopped. Um, I won the Sweet Cake Challenge, so that was kind of a crazy experience where nobody really told you what you were making at all. You just had to memorize as many baking recipes as you could, which were fast and adaptable, and then you just showed up. So that, that was kind of a surreal experience to see oneself on TV. Um, I was second place in the final for the Chopped Sweets. Uh, some green cotton candy by my competitor really wowed the judges and kicked my butt. So to this day, I hate cotton candy. Uh, anyway, what I might do at this point is just go ahead and, and start delving into our recipe. I chose this, it's a really simple coffee cake and you're gonna say it's super unassuming and like not fancy, but it is the perfect thing for a family to make for their moms for Mother's Day or for a mom to make for herself or for anybody to make for themselves. We're not gonna judge. Um, the thing I love, a couple things I love about this recipe, number one, it keeps well, so you can make it tomorrow and serve it to your mom on Sunday. You can make it today and serve it to your mom on Sunday um, or your family. Um, second thing, it's pretty light on technique. It's nothing too crazy. There aren't really any crazy ingredients. Um, for me, baking should be very approachable. You don't need to have fancy Kobe beef or fancy cuts of salmon or very exotic produce. It's stuff that's probably laying around the house. Oats, brown sugar, butter, flour, eggs. Um, and you could do so much with it. So that's the second reason. Third reason is this recipe is very adaptable. So you could play around with any kind of flavor. I'm going to be doing a, um, a nut berry version today, but I can talk about it as I go along. What other ingredients, what other flavors and substitutions. And actually on the um, recipe that I sent for you guys to see, it does give you some variations at the bottom as well. So it, let's say you have coconut, almond and chocolate laying around, then use that. Let's say you have apples, so I'll take some apples, get them a little caramelized, fold that. Let's say you have fresh peaches or apricots. You can do anything, you can add different extracts, you can use any different nuts you want, you can omit nuts and do just oats, whatever you want. So, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we should go ahead and rock and roll. Okay, um, there are two different ways to make this recipe. One is going to be to just stir everything by hand and we can do it that way for the interest of time i thought i would use my blue mixer i do have to give a shout out to this little blue mixer is my first mixer i ever had i got it 29 and a half years ago when i got married from um my aunt, my husband's aunt judy and it is still like my little baby blue it's low speed is very high so we're gonna have to deal with a little like things flying out you can use a mixer, you can use a hand beater if you want with the zoom, 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 or you can just stir it by hand. But we're gonna do this just to kind of make things a little easier. We can zoom in if we need to. Um, my camera operator over there is um, standing at the ready to zoom in if anybody wants to see, or I can also take the bowl off the machine. Maybe that would be easier. Um, so the recipe starts with streusel. And you're gonna say, what's streusel? It just a reason to eat crunchy stuff from my perspective and to give it additional flavor and texture. What we're going to do once we assemble the coffee cakes, um, we're gonna put them in these, you know, the same things. We're gonna put half our batter down, some streusel, 
another half hour batter, and then more streusel on top. So it's going to have a nice layering effect. Um, and honestly, this is one thing I should mention. You can totally make larger batches, but you're going to have to add on some time in terms of the baking. The way we tell when something's baked, I always tell people, they'll ask me, how long does it take to bake? And I say, until it's done. I'm sorry. I can't tell you. I don't know what kind of oven you have. I don't know how many times you open and close it. Um, you want to touch the top and it wants to spring back. If it doesn't spring back, it means there's still liquidy batter under there. So the other thing you can do, this is a large knife, but if you had a very small paring knife, which I don't have beside me, you would just put a knife in the coffee cake or any cake for that matter. And if the knife comes out clean, that means that, that there's no batter left. It's all completely baked. Okay, so let's start with streusel. Um, I had planned to do pecans. We're good, Deirdre? Okay. I put two pecans and then I realized that I had run out of pecans. So I arranged around in my cupboard over there and I found that we have some hazelnuts as well. So I toasted these ahead of time because toasting nuts is not really that exciting. I mean, from my perspective, maybe some people think it's exciting. But what I, um, what I do want to mention is please don't forget your nuts in the oven because once you smell that they're done, they're almost too done. You wanna have your timer on, I would say six minutes, eight minutes, just check it. Um, you don't want them to be super dark, but you want them to have a little more toastiness than having just raw nuts, it just doesn't have the flavor. And if you remember, we're gonna be layering it into the coffee cake, so we don't wanna have raw nuts down there because they won't get any crunchiness from the oven. So I'm just gonna give them a quick rough chop. The original recipe actually asked for them to be like food processed, which seemed like overkill because anyone who knows me knows that I love texture and I love crunchy. So the more crunchy the better. So we don't wanna have them turn into fine dusty powder. You can always omit this or you could do only an oat brown sugar streusel if you want it as well. Like I said, it's very adaptable. Okay. So I'm chopping my nuts, and streusel, you know, honestly, you could just leave it out if you wanted, but we're going to put it in, because I like it. And I am going to get this later, so, okay. So in our bowl, I'm just going to throw our nuts in there. I have some brown sugar, packed, and some oats. And I am going to grab a spoon, break it up with a spoon a little bit. Nothing else is going to happen to this other than it's just going to get stirred. I know it's exciting stuff. But it's just going to get stirred and then set aside, and we'll use it later. And I actually did an extra big batch of streusel because I had tested the recipe the other day and it seemed like I wanted more. It was I wanted more. If you have extra, just toss it with a little bit of um, melted butter if you don't use it, and then bake it off in the oven and you've got Okay. So that's it. Nothing too high tech in terms of our streusel. Okay. Now, how can, do we see okay in this? Okay. Should I move it over here? Okay. So, in our KitchenAid mixer, little blue, which is obviously seen a little action. Out. Um, we are going to put in four ounces of butter. One thing I will mention, don't think about it. Don't worry about it. It's butter. Fat carries flavor. Your body likes it. Your body feels good when you're eating fat. So you really don't want to, don't worry about dieting. In this one moment, just eat the butter, okay? Don't get stressed out about it. Okay, we're also going to put in our sugar. And I have here one and a quarter cups of sugar. One thing we do is um, we use baking scales because when you're making a large batch of recipe, you don't want to be scooping out nine cups of flour or whatever it is. I always end up with a count anyway. So what I do when I start a recipe is I actually weigh the base recipe, like I weigh what a one and a quarter cups of sugar is, and then. Um, convert that to either grams or ounces, and then I can expand it that way. This recipe is a little unusual in that it is gonna ask us to put our leavening, so we've got some baking powder, baking soda, and salt. I told you it was a little fat. 
get our powder, our soda, and our salt. And those of you who are not bakers, you can tell the screaming about this. Can you give me a call? Uh, it is a low speed, as it's about. Um, this is the creamy method. The idea is that we want this butter and sugar mixture to be very nice and emulsified. If you're making something like a barbecue cookie or a or any kind of um, even a shortbread, you're not going to need a lot of air in it. What? Okay. Well, it's getting a little paler. It's nice and fluffy. We want to give it a little more air, a little more emulsification. So what I was saying before, when I was mixing, and you probably couldn't hear me, was we're building in a lot of bubbles into this butter sugar mixture. The baking powder and the baking soda, when they go in the oven, are going to act on those bubbles and make them larger. That's what we're going to have a nice leavened product, a nice airy product. For something like cookies, you don't want them to be super fluffy, so you're going to mix it just until it's combined and smooth. You're not going to be air into it. But something like a cake or a pound cake, you do want to give it a little more air. So we're going to give it a couple minutes. You can see it's already paler, and um, you know it's a little on the fluffy side. Please do not use cold butter. Just pull it out a couple hours before. It's not going to go bad. You can leave it at a room temperature. Um, but you just definitely need the butter to be um, nice and room temperature. But if you microwave it, of course, it's going to have that big pool in the middle that's going to be melted. I'm really only mixing on low speed here. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. So it's nice and fluffy. Can you see that? It's nice and fluffy. It's starting to loosen up. It's starting to stick to the bottom of the bowl a little bit. It's not just kind of whipping around in a clump. If for some reason you are in a hurry, for instance, when I was on Chopped, I was in a hurry mixing stuff. So I actually started the mixer, and then I had a, a blowtorch just because Two chefs all a couple of torches. Um, and I, as the mixer was going on low speed, I actually just warmed up the outside of the bowl a little bit, and that really helps. That really helps loosen up your butter mixture. Please do not buy the um, creme brulee torches that you can get at Wings Sonoma, that kind of thing. No offense to them, but you can get a blue bottle pro propane um, blowtorch or, you know, $12 at Home Depot or Lowe's. So that's what we do. <laughs> A little more. Oh, now I'll show you what this looks like. I think we're pretty good now. So it's really pale. It's got a lot of nice airiness to it. The butter um, and sugar mixture will never get smooth. It's granulated sugar, it's never going to get smooth, but that's okay. When it goes in the oven, the heat of the oven will melt the butter. So you're not going to have a creamy texture, but so you're not looking for that. You don't want to beat it to the point where butter starts to melt, um, but that would take a little long time. This is the challenge with making it by hand. It's quite a bit of muscle power to get it to this, whoopsie, to this um, stage. So, what I'm going to do. And if you just notice, I did break my eggs. We always break our eggs into another container because what can happen is if we break our eggs directly into the bowl, and this has happened to everybody, again, learning by doing it the wrong way, a shell gets in there. And then your pan's natural tendency is to jump in there, which is bad because it's a machine and it's on and you could mangle yourself. So I always ask people, go ahead and break them into the container. And then if there are any eggshells, don't worry fishing it around. They'll fall to the bottom and just pay attention when you pour it out. So normal creamy method. 
classic creamy method pound cake, any kind of cake usually, is butter sugar, fluffy, 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 maximum whipping. Then you're going to add the eggs gradually as you're whipping as well. You can't really over mix it at this stage. Of course, I said that at one time at Cypress College when I was teaching a class and the person really did over mix it to the point where the butter had melted. So <laughs> reasonable uh, amount of time you cannot over mix it. But once you start adding your flour, you really don't want to mix it too much because what tends to happen once flour gets wet and gets stirred is you start to develop gluten, which is not a bad thing. It's what we like about flour. So you definitely want to kind of less is more at the end of the mix. At the beginning, we want to go crazy, but at the end, we really want to be as minimal as possible. I just went ahead and sipped in my flour. I was always an anti-sifter, but I realized that um, you really want to get all those lumps out, whatever is in there. The one thing I did forget, two things I did forget. I'm going to go ahead and zest a uh, fresh orange. You don't have to do this. It's good when you do, but it's also fine when you don't. Um, if you have any other citrus hanging around, we actually have some passion fruit puree in the freezer. I was thinking that would be awesome to just throw a little passion fruit puree in here. Again, the recipe is very adaptable. So you can do a lot with it. So, um, fortunately, someone just brought us these and they smell so good. So, I'm going to throw this guy in with the eggs. And I'm also going to throw in vanilla. Um, I don't know if this is an un unpopular opinion, but for something that has a lot of chocolate in it, I don't bother putting vanilla in because I feel like it's overwhelmed. But in something like this, that is not chocolatey. <sighs> something like this, which is not chocolatey, we really do um, want to throw a little vanilla in. And we use a vanilla, um, a pretty strong vanilla extract to the baby, so I can follow the book. So I'm going to throw that guy in. It doesn't really matter where the, when the vanilla goes in. Ideally, I would have put the orange zest in with the butter and sugar mixture. But I got ahead of myself because that happened. Um, and I forgot. So I'm going to put it in. Okay. So our vanilla is in there. Now I'm going to alternate the flour and the egg mixture. So I'm going to put about a third of the flour in here. The nice thing about this recipe, too, you can totally make it with kids of any age. Um, there's not much to it technique-wise in terms of being complicated, but on the other hand, you make something really yummy. We made, I think, six yesterday, and I think we devoured, we devoured like four of them, so <laughs> with a group of uh, five of us here. This mixer goes very quickly, so I'm just going to on off it <laughs> so the flour doesn't fly everywhere. <laughs> I don't know if you can see in my mixer. Can you see that, Deirdre? Yeah. Um, I'm not mixing it all the way. It will get mixed all the way, but I'm not doing it right now. I'm going to put in one of my eggs and some of my best. Anything? Hold on. I know a lot of home bakers like to um, scrape down the bowl a lot. You can do it once or twice, but we really, we'll get it all. I'm not worried. And I'm going to actually fold it quite a bit once I take it off the machine, because I feel like that's when you really get down underneath. I'll show you my folding process. So, I'm off again. And then the last bit of egg with the nice corn test. I wish you guys could smell this. It smells so good. Okay. And then lots of the flour. It's classic bakery thing. We have all these gigantic bowls everywhere. And my poor little raspberries did get covered. Okay, on off, on off, on off. And I'm going to off the machine in just a minute. Three, two, one. That's it. So. Last thing, so you're thinking, oh, she's done. This is it, right? No, because what's more delicious than butter, sugar, flour, and eggs is butter, sugar, flour, and eggs, and sour cream. So we are going to fold a cup of sour cream into this. Now, 
if you have yogurt and not sour cream, or I'm trying to think what else would be a good substitution. I'm sure there are some other options. Um, you can you can use different kind of thick dairy products. Okay, so I'm folding it just to make sure it's all incorporated underneath. Because as much as I love KitchenAid mixers, sometimes the paddle doesn't quite hit the bottom of the bowl. So you really want to make sure you get all the way down there. And then I'm going to incorporate half of my sour cream mixture. And I need to confess, we ran out of sour cream. I had about three quarters of a cup of sour cream. So I substituted the rest of the yogurt myself. So there you go. I guess that's one area you can cut it a little corner if you want. Although it's whole milk yogurt, so it's still got lots of nice calories in it. Can you see the inside of the bowl okay? So you don't want to do this on the machine because you really don't need to over mix it. Hopefully you can get a sense of folding. I'm almost kind of turning the batter over on itself to incorporate. Every last bit in here. And if you have someone to help you with the dishes, all the better. All the rest. And like I mentioned, you could do stone fruit, chocolate, any kind of other nut if you wanted to put nuts in the streusel and in the, the mixture itself. It's very adaptable. So ideally, if you're doing a lot of quarantine baking, Whatever you have hanging around, you could incorporate. That's edible and super important. The other thing you can do is take out three quarter, sorry, one quarter of the flour and substitute in some nice cocoa powder if you wanted to make a chocolate-based version. You might need to test it a little bit to get the ratio, because I'm going off the top of my head. It looks beautiful. I actually don't like to eat batter, so I'm not gonna taste it, but it looks beautiful. Now, I'm gonna fold in some raspberries and blackberries, and then we're just gonna portion. And you're gonna say, why aren't you washing these? Because they will turn to slime. The berries have a nice protective coating on the outside, and if we wash them off, they will really kind of degrade into nothing. So I'm gonna just, Hold those little babies in, and then we're going to portion. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing. I did not measure my berries, as you could probably notice. So I'll throw some more in if I feel like we need to. OK. OK, I'm going to use gloves because the hand is an amazing tool, and Using an ice cream scoop or anything like that is not really that convenient. But what I am going to do is actually weigh out. I told you at the bakery we weigh a lot of stuff, we weigh everything. Um, I'm going to, each of these containers is about 13 ounces. So what I will do is put about half of that down. Make sure I get some nice berries in there. And then I'm not ambidextrous, but I'm going to pretend to be. Put some treacle down and then top it off at 13 and go on to the next one or close to it. If you overfill these, which is a, one of my Achilles heels, I always want to like give people more stuff and make it more nice and full and fluffy, they will um, overflow, which is a bummer because it'll bake up, but there's not enough structure to hold it. And then it'll kind of tunnel out and form a little, a little rivulet of batter on the pan. And then we just do one more. We're almost done. I think it's gonna. This one's gonna yield about three of these smaller loaf pans. You can do any size loaf pan for something where it's actually a metal pan. I do encourage you to line the bottom with parchment because it's gonna be easier to get out of the pan. Um, there's nothing worse than having a beautiful product and then not being able to serve it because it's all stuck. And you're going to say, wait a minute, you forgot to put the streusel on top. I'll do that in a sec. That's pretty good, actually. Got a little bit left. 
I'm going to hold myself to that 13 ounce standard so that way they don't overflow. Push these guys down. They will get flat when they bake. I'm not going to get too worried about them. perfect. And I'm just going to put the rest of that drizzle down. And these bake at 350. This size loaf pans went for about 52 minutes yesterday. But like I said, test it. That'll be fine. So I'm going to put these in my oven. And I'm going to take out of my oven, do the magic of prior planning. <laughs> these, are, these are our final, final version. Um, what else? Should I cut one open? I could. The proof is in the pudding. Or in the cake. And these are nice because you can just you see like there's a little mine of nuts and berries there. Learn how much to look at it. Boy, boy, oh boy. Whoopsie. There we go. I kind of eviscerated it, but I'm gonna taste some. So, we're at 23 minutes. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Yes, uh, Rachel, thank you. That that was wonderful. Um, can you hear me okay? I can. Rachel? So I'm chewing, yes. Okay, yeah. great. Oh, looking for my water. Well, we're all jealous of you. I, I'm certainly jealous of you. I wish I had that uh, ready to, to eat right now for <laughs> nice little lunch treats. <laughs> I should deliver uh, some to that But yeah, time. we do. <laughs> I'll stop by Black Market. Uh, so we do have a number of uh, questions for you. I okay. wanted to say thanks first for walking us through that. Your story, your story as an anteater is uh, fascinating. Um, you also mentioned your 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 mom is an anteater, was on staff, and I worked with her. I don't know if you, did, you may not have known that, but I worked alongside her. I uh, did not know that. That's campus. awesome. So, <laughs> Very We're small world. To, um, to guys who love UCI or love UCI. Yeah. Well, we all share in the anteater spirit, as does everyone else on this uh, Zoom event. So, uh, allow me then to get into some of the questions. Um, I'm going to start with. Uh, let's see. Um, we have a question from Christina Burns that came in earlier, and you touched on this a little bit, but what? And we're going to have a lot of questions here, so we'll see how many we can get through, um, depending on your responses. But what became your inspiration to open your bakeries? And uh, was cooking and baking always your passion? I, I have um, uh, my father and I would make pies very often. And I, have, I had two grandmothers that were both known for um, their desserts. My grandmother, Virginia, was all about the pound cake and the banana pudding. Um, so there was definitely family history, but I didn't do a lot of cooking and baking when I was younger at all, really. It wasn't until, um, I guess, college. And then once I had my own kids, I started trying to figure out. I started with sourdough bread, actually. Again mm. and again and again. Um, home with four small children, just trying to figure out how to make sourdough bread. So that's, that's what kind of piqued my interest. And I just felt like that was something that really appeal to my analytical side and my creative side and um, touching food product and the eating, of course. So it all seemed to work really nicely together. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we, we have a question from Ronnie Friedman. Uh, at some point you mentioned that you were doing uh, classes at the bakery in Sky Park uh, across from John Wayne. Are those yes. still going on or do you have any other educational opportunities? <laughs> It's funny, we did those for so many years and um, my time just got really compressed in terms of having to wear the business owner hat more so. Um, so we don't do those right now. What I've been doing is short demos, a lot of times actually right in this spot 
in this kitchen um, and putting videos up on our website and adding recipes to that so people can access that. We're opening a new location in East Village in San Diego, which I know it's not in Orange County, but we will be crafting the kitchen in such a way so that in the evenings we can be doing more of those immersive classes again because it was I, I love hands-on like the way to really learn is to do it yourself and have me and my assistant standing right beside you you know guiding you so it's not right now but it's coming right on well this is one so everyone got a little uh, sneak peek uh so thank you for for donating your your time to do so today for the anteaters in the in the audience uh what is your suggestion for those of us who don't have a food scale? It's funny. If it's a recipe that calls for cups and, and spoons, use that. Totally fine. Um, I would warn you that like, a cup of flour does vary in weight from like four to four and a half ounces, depending on humidity, um, you know, how long ago you poured it into the container that you're skipping it from. Um, if you have a recipe that has ounces or grams, I found, I can't remember the name of it right now, but if you put in your Google search bar, like how many cups is 22 ounces of flour or bread, 22 ounces of bread flour, there's a good website. I don't know the do you know that name? I don't know the name of the website, but you'll it'll be one of the very top ones and it has really good conversions. King Arthur, um, their website also has really nice conversions. So if you have if you don't have a scale and you have a recipe that calls for weights, I would look each thing up that way. Um, because a cup of flour and a cup of sugar, you're like, oh, they probably weigh the same. No, a cup of sugar is around seven. <laughs> a cup of flour is about four or four and a half. So it's, it's not a one-to-one. -one. Uh, a pint is a pound in terms of water and liquid. Pints a pound the world around. So a, a pound of water is 16 ounces which is two cups but for other stuff definitely convert because baking recipes are a little fussy in terms of being precise you know you can really go south if you have too much flour or not enough liquid so converting is, mm -hmm. is definitely the way to go hopefully that answered uh -huh. all these questions yeah yeah certainly uh thank you I, i've got a combo question here another practical one um, Chris Lundquist asks, uh, do you need to use paper liners? And then on a related note, Angela Lou asks, what type of baking pans are you using? You can use any loaf pan, honestly. You could even make a muffin size if you wanted to just make a little teeny one in a, a muffin paper. When, when you bake commercially, you really don't want to be in a position where the product looks great, but it's stuck in the pan. So even when we use um, sheet pans, and I think you saw like on my um, half sheet pans, I put parchment down, you always want to fudge and make sure that you can get the product out. So if you wanted to use a, a larger loaf pan, like a, one of those really big loaf pans, like eight by 13, would probably, you'd probably make one or two, I guess, maybe even just one. Um, Spray it really good with pan spray or brush it with melted butter if you don't like uh, the spray. And then line at least the bottom with parchment. Um, hopefully that answered the question. I mean, you can really use anything, yeah. but you got to change a baking time. That's it. Mm. You, can't, okay. you can't depend on the timer to say, oh, 52 minutes, it's, it's done now. Because if it's still gooey in the middle, yeah, got to keep going. OK. Great. Uh, so we have a question from Matt Morris, and he's uh, wondering if is it easy to swap out uh, for gluten-free flour, or is there any other way to to convert this or modify this to be a gluten-free recipe? That's a great question. Um, we've been using a uh, Justos G I U S T O apostrophe S gluten-free blend that is has some almond flour in it. Um, when I use gluten-free flour in a recipe, I still, I use like three quarters to even, whatever, seven eighths of that flour, but I still add some ground nuts because I feel like the gluten-free flour has a little bit of an odd texture. So if you put some ground nuts into the recipe, like grind them with the flour, 
it will obfuscate or kind of confuse the palette so you're not like, oh, it's all kind of gloppy, you know, because some gluten free flowers, I know Bob's Red Mill has a good baking blend as well. Um, so definitely, I would say like probably seven eighths of the recipe, you could use your gluten free flour, but then choose a nut that you like. Um, almond is always a good one because most people are allergic to them as opposed to like a, a walnut or a pecan, and they're a little less expensive as well. And grind mm -hmm. that with your flour. But I wouldn't put myself in a position where it's like, okay, people are coming in three hours. Let's figure out this gluten-free version. You know, do it the day before, get out the kinks, and then mm -hmm. you'll know what to do, and you can always adjust up or down a little bit. But yeah, it should work nicely. We did that with the uh, galette dough that we make at the bakery. We use the ground almonds, and then the juice dose, gluten flour. Okay. Um. Here's a fun question. Um, how did you come up with the name Black Market Bakery? <laughs> so hard. Um, first of all, back in the day, and the alum probably would, would remember this, there was a time when we looked up things in phone books. So you didn't want to be at the bottom of the list. It wasn't like Stanley's Bakery, you know, where you're down at the very bottom. So Black Market Bakery. And I love alliteration. So there you go. It had to start with a B. Plus, my husband and I we went to uni high school. We met there before we went to UCI, and we're both kind of a little attitude hungry. So I was like, yeah, we're not cute. We're not Southern. We don't like cupcakes. I mean, we are Southern. We're not cute. We're not French. We're not fancy. Um, so <laughs> the little kind of sassy attitude, which is why you know, we have this logo that kind of looks like this. Oh, um, and the cake. Um, and then the idea was, you know, a lot of bakeries especially back in that era when we were figuring all this stuff out in like 2004, you know, there was doors. You didn't know what went on back in there. You saw the display case, but back in the back, like, are these mixes? What are, what are they doing? So we wanted to be very upfront. Like, it's only the good stuff. It's only real butter, real flour, real sugar, no mixes. You know, you need to know a guy, and he'll get it for you. Black market. So, and lately we've been selling, like, sourdough starter and yeast and flour to people you know like under the table practically because no one can get it so we're actually kind of living up to our our name right now ah very good in fact we have a question on that very thing uh jill livingston asks what's the best recipe or way to start my own uh sourdough or yeast starter okay. is that something you offer at black market um so we you can buy our starter is called hubert and he's been he she it whatever has been around for about 15 years but a sourdough starter is basically just a flour and water environment we do a one-to-one -one ratio so it's equal parts by weight of flour and water and i started it it takes about a five or six day process i will tell um the person who asked this the book bread alone by Dan Leader was the one that just like unlocked all of this stuff and demystified it for me. He tells you how to, he calls it the Levin, but it's a natural sourdough starter. It is basically the flour and water is an environment, so to speak, for the natural yeast that are just floating around in the air. So you don't add yeast to it. Mm. And it's balanced between like the natural yeast and then the lactobacillus and the acetobacillus. They just happen to kind of show up there and it's this happy little balance. It takes a while to get started. So if they want to get our starter and just elaborate that, that's fine. Um, I think of it as like a, like a little fish tank, so to speak. Like you just want to have a nice water environment with nice water and nice flour and then these little bacteria and natural yeast are just munching along and doing their own thing. Um, you don't have to start it yourself, but if you are interested in doing that, um, Dan Leader, the book is called Bread Alone. It's, it's really old. It's from like the early 90s, I think, but that was the one that really guided me through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, have, we have a number of questions. We have a lot of prying eyes kind of examining your kitchen and baking space, and some curious questions here. So a little unrelated, but Adelie Duran is uh, dying to know what you use that glass carboy for. Uh, whether it may be beer, wine, kombucha, or something else? Um, boy, I didn't realize I was in the shot, actually. Um, <laughs> so, so I have four children. Um, the oldest is in Texas. He's a filmmaker um, and gaffer and 
video guy um, extraordinaire. He's there. I have a daughter that's in the Middle East. She's in the Army. And then my youngest two are one's with the Naval Academy, and one is my camera operator is a student at Rhode Island School of Design. They're both here with me. And they've been here with me since spring break. So Levi, the, the Naval Academy one, you it's not your thing, yeah. Um, he has been making ginger beer and sauerkraut and all things fermented. What oh kimchi is in the oven in the uh, uh, refrigerator right now. He, it's his it's his jam. He's experimenting. So yeah, that, this is not my baby, but it's cool looking. <laughs> but that's why it's there. <laughs> He's always looking at the like I want to make. Da, da, da. You know, we made homemade dumplings, we made homemade ramen noodles, and um, homemade pasta, and all sorts of crazy experiments. So, but he's the so if, uh, the kitchen experimenting uh, runs in the family. It seems like that's wonderful. Yeah, um, the eating. I think we have time for another question or two. Uh, this is a, a nice one from an, uh, an anonymous attendee. But would you say culinary school is crucial to starting a business? Or is it more important to gain experience from apprenticeship or working in a bakery? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it depends what you want to do in the business. If you want to be the pastry chef and be in the kitchen all day, then culinary school is definitely a big asset. Um, I would work in, an, in the industry first and decide, you know, yes, I really do want to work super crazy hours on like Christmas Eve and, you know, Easter Eve and the day before Thanksgiving. Um, if you want to be in the kitchen, definitely work in the kitchen, make sure you like it. And the culinary school does help, but I went to culinary school, so I'm not trying to diss it or anything, but you do make every recipe a couple times max and you get tons of technique thrown at you. And then once you're working in wherever it is you're working, then you start to kind of develop things for yourself. Trial and error, you know, I, I did everything wrong multiple times. And maybe I, by now I've learned a few things. Um, on the other hand, if you're interested in the business part of it, which is what I have transitioned into from coming, from being in the kitchen all the time and not growing my business, to now working a lot more on growing my business and dealing with banks and loans and pitch decks and, you know, real estate people and branding and marketing and all that stuff. Um, if you think you have a vision that is strong, you can hire someone to be in the kitchen. I have people in the kitchen for me right now. You have bakers that show up 11 o'clock at night and bang out beautiful bread. You know, I don't have to do that. So my job is to be in the front. So if you're interested in being in the, not being in the front, but being the owner, being the driving force, then what I coulda, shoulda, woulda done was actually go to business school, which I did not do. So I learned a lot of things the hard way that way. But it's just um, for the person who asked the question, definitely work in a business first because it's not glamorous like on Food Network. <laughs> it's a lot of like, you know, hauling around 50 pound bags of flour and, and dealing with customers who ask you a million questions, which is fine, but you know, it's. There's a lot more to it than just, oh, I'm expressing myself through cake decorating, um, which is also fun. So just deciding like which end of the business or which end of the entity you want to inhabit, the kitchen side or the business side, and then getting training in either of those areas is important. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for answering that and all the other questions, Rachel. Uh, we are going to start to, to wrap up now. Um, I want uh, everyone to uh, you know, kind of give their thanks to Rachel virtually. We'll send sending you virtual thanks for, for your time and uh, sure. tutorial here. Um, that was fantastic. So thank you. Um, wow. Now we know what to make for, uh, for Mother's Day for, for our families go. and whatnot. <laughs> um, so I want to give everyone a heads up. Uh, don't log off yet because we have a couple of pop-up poll questions uh, very quick uh, here on the Zoom. Um, so please take, uh, keep a lookout for that. We want to know um, how you enjoyed this event, obviously, um, and then uh, your interest in future events. In fact, uh, we will have our next Lunch with Eaters uh, on Friday, May 22nd uh, from 12 to 1, just like today. So every other Friday is our plan. 
We're going to have a very special program lined up. Uh, I'm excited to announce it, although I'm unable to announce it at this time. So keep, keep an eye on your email and our Anteaters Go virtual website. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun programming coming your way. We want to provide uh, you a way to reach out to us if you have any follow-up questions. Feel free to email us. Uh, we're always there at alumni at uci.edu, the UCI Alumni Association. Of course, uh, please be sure to stop by Black Market Bakery in Costa Mesa uh, and taste the strudel or the streusel, um, which uh, Rachel baked today. You know, sample and uh, and other goodies in person because uh, it's it's just a great bakery and we're we're lucky to have Rachel. Uh, give her time and, and tips on how we can emulate her success in our own kitchens. So, uh, so yeah, thank you uh, everyone for joining us. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Uh, do we have another poll question or are we at the end? Polls are closed. Okay. So with that, I will wrap it up. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much once again. Uh, Audience, uh, feel free to send questions to alumni at uci.edu. And once again, thanks everybody for joining. <laughs>